first segment, we had David Cake from Electronic Frontiers Australia, and we did lose one of our special guests, Benjamin Dean from Columbia University. We've got him during this segment. In this segment, also, we've got Karun Cowper, an independent journalist, and we'll go to Karun Cowper first, who's actually quite versed in mass surveillance. Karun, um, we'll be going to in a minute after we've just gone to another snippet of Edward Snowden, and let's see that. Everything you did only matters if we have this conversation properly. Sorry, guys. So let me help you out there. You mentioned in an interview that the NSA was passing around naked photos of people. Yeah, this is something where it's, uh, it's not actually seen as a big deal in the culture of NSA, uh, because you see naked pictures all of the time. That terrifies people. Because when we ask people about that, this is the response you get. The government should not be able to look at dick pictures. If the government was looking at a picture of Gordon's penis, I definitely feel it would be an invasion of my privacy. Uh, yeah, if the government was looking at pictures of my penis, that would upset me. They should never, ever, the U.S. government, have a picture of my dick. If my husband sent me a picture of his penis, and the government could access it, I, w I would want that program to be shut down. I would want the dick pic program changed. I would also want the dick pic program changed. I think it would be terrific if the program could change. I would want it to be tweaked. I would want it to have, have clear and transparent laws that, that we knew about um, and that were communicated to us uh, to understand what they were being used for or why they were being kept. If I had knowledge that the U.S. government had a picture of my dick, I would be very pissed off. Well, the good news is there's no program named the dick pic program. The bad news is they are still collecting everybody's information, including your dick pic. This is the most visible line in the sand for people. Can they see my dick? That is a picture of my dick. So let's go through each NSA program and explain to me its capabilities in regards to that photograph of my penis. So, 702 surveillance, can they see my dick? Yes. The uh, FISA Amendments Act of 2008, uh, which Section 702 falls under, uh, allows the bulk collection of internet communications that are one end foreign. So if you have your email somewhere like Gmail, hosted on a server overseas or transferred overseas or at any time crosses outside the borders of the United States, your junk ends up in the database. Even if you send it to somebody within the United States, your wholly domestic communication between you and your wife can go from New York to London and back and get caught up in the database. Executive Order 12333, uh, dick or no dick? Uh, yes. EO-12333 is what the NSA uses when the other authorities aren't aggressive enough or they're not catching as much as they'd like. When you send your junk uh, mm -hmm. through Gmail, for example, yeah. that's stored on Google's servers. Google moves data from data center to data center, invisibly to you without your knowledge. Your data could be moved outside the borders of the United States oh, no. temporarily when your junk was passed by Gmail, the NSA caught a copy of that. PRISM. PRISM is how they pull your junk out of Google with Google's involvement. All of the different PRISM partners, people like Yahoo, Facebook, Google, the government deputizes them to be uh, sort of their little surveillance sheriff. Edward, if the American people understood this, they would be absolutely horrified. I guess I never thought about putting it in the, the context of your junk. Welcome back to Opinionated. During this segment, we'll hear from Benjamin Dean from New York, cybersecurity expert, Columbia University. But before that, we'll hear first from Karun Cowper, independent journalist and expert on mass surveillance. You've just listened, Karun. You've just listened, Karun, to Edward Snowden. And we've just seen a little bit of a send-up there, uh, a, a, a statue of David sort of argument. That's galvanized people's attention. Maybe the product of that is, it's a product of mass propaganda. But what will galvanize people's attention? How can we frame this discussion to actually get to the uh, real issues? That's the, the million dollar question, isn't it, Jerry? I mean, I'm, I'm, 
apart from being a, a citizen journalist, I'm also involved as an activist in various campaigns. And, you know, how do we get the message through to the Australian people about, you know, the importance of this issue? I mean, I mean, there's it, it unfortunately a, a lot of issues, I guess, that uh, the Australian people are, you know, due to the, the poor quality of the, of the media, the, the corporate dom dominance of the media, we don't uh, understand these things as well as we should. Um, thanks to Snowden, we have uh, some opportunity to understand this. But just uh, in April this year, uh, bipartisan support, we had uh, the mandatory, um, mandatory retention laws go through. Uh, they keep track of all the emails we've sent, who we've emailed, not the content of the email, but who we've emailed. Um, but but, but is mass surveillance part of the human narrative? From the beginning of time, we've always had this dichotomy of the oppressed and the oppressor. And uh, we've always had uh, those who are meritocrats who run the show and the shadow are your elites. So you talked about uh, the corporate dominance of uh, uh, the media, but is it not the shadowy uh, supranationals who are actually running the show and it's all intertwined? Do we really believe that we have a capacity to take them on when they're actually working extrajudicially? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a huge question. I mean, obviously, we're just seeing this pic from Edward Snowden here. We can make some impression on the, you know, on the, the challenges that you've, you know, you've highlighted there. Uh, we have to have some optimism that, that we can make some impact on these things. But, but is optimism a fool's paradise? Is optimism some utopian extravagance? Because we have to look at what WikiLeaks did. Oh. We have to look at the sacrifice of Julian Assange and also the sacrifice of Edward Snowden. And yet we haven't actually generated that uh, cultural shift. We've galvanised a lot of support amongst people. But in terms of a major cultural shift, that hasn't happened. We aren't actually railing at the seams to do something about that. We have Chelsea Manning in jail at the moment. Obviously, Julian Assange is being terribly... Uh restricted in his capacity to, to carry on the fight, although very courageously he's, he's continuing to do so. But, you know, uh, as I say, we, we have to have some hope and as far but how as... how can we have hope when, you know, <laughs> I, I want your opinion, but how can we have hope, and I'm being the devil's advocate yeah. here, when the Obama administration has actually uh, prosecuted and jailed more whistleblowers than any other administration in American history? Well, it's, it's not perhaps all that hopeful. Uh, this is... What I'm grasping at at the moment, Jerry, is we have, since the Snowden revelations, uh, an increase of about seven, by 700 million people, apparently, that have taken more notice of this. And, and uh, that's, that's figures that, uh, you know, people uh, and businesses that have increased their encryption rate. The, this is overall data that's, uh, that, that's increased. Okay. So that's, what do you mean by they've increased their encryption rates, enhanced their uh, uh, encryption? Well, that's that's. I understand this is the the people that are and the businesses that are that are who weren't before that are now utilising the technology that that is available. Uh, we were chatting with uh, with David uh, off air before about uh, Google and Apple actually whether they're just seeing a business opportunity or, or not, which is probably the case. But but they're it, selling at our footprint and our fingerprint all over the joint. Well, they are, but they have change their, yeah. um, the way that they're doing their business to provide these uh, tools you know, more accessible for, for people. But at the end of the day, w as with many other issues in our society, we need to actually have some mass movement against this, these, uh, these problems. You know? Okay. Karun, thank you. We'll hear again from you in, in the last segment. Let's move to our guest from New York, Benjamin Dean, cybersecurity expert, internet governance, Columbia University. Thank you for hanging in there, Benjamin. No, thank you very much. With all this talk about NSA and Five Eyes, it's little wonder that I had trouble getting through. <laughs> okay, now that uh, maybe your six eyes here watching and, and hovering over us in some sort of angelic way, what you've heard a little bit of the discussion here today. What hope do you have in terms of cybersecurity and uh, in us being able to actually, is, it, is digital rights a lie? Is digital rights a possibility or a lie? Well, it's a very interesting turn of events because the discussion that's happening in Australia right now with the metadata retention laws, um, Australia is really stepping in the opposite direction to the way in which the United States is stepping. Now, over the last few months, there was a long wrangle over Section 215 in the Patriot Act, which had authorised bulk telecommunications collection in the United States. Um, and that expired. Now, some might say it was simply because Congress was so inept that they couldn't put through any renewals. Uh, but sure enough, in came the USA Freedom Act, uh, not a week later, uh, that put in place various safeguards that weren't in place before. So at a legal level, there is hope, and it's being seen somewhat in the on United note, States let, right let me now. just get you on that note. You said uh, on a legal level. 
They're actually been yes. uh, acting extrajudicially. They've been doing things. There's been oversight. There's been legislation. There have been laws. There's the U.S. Constitution. There's uh, you know our laws in this country. But yet the NSA has acted without any transparency and has acted outside the law. So it has been found. So even if we enable these laws, how are we going to enable the oversight? The legality of the telecommunications collection in the United States is still being disputed. And in fact, just this week, another appeals court threw out the previous verdict that said that it indeed was illegal. You've got to understand that a lot of these activities are indeed endorsed by law and conducted under the law, like the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So there is hope if we're able to get some kind of legal change. I don't think there's as much hope there, though, as we might find through economic drivers or technical drivers. Now, your guest has just mentioned increased use of encryption, which is an excellent way in which anybody is able to better secure their communications. I would also say that people need to be more cognizant of uh, what they're demanding from software developers. They need to be able to look for more secure code. They need to be demanding better security, better treatment of their data. Uh, how, do we actually, do. how do we actually go about actually demanding that from our software developers? Well, in the, the neoliberal dream slash nightmare that we currently find ourselves unable to awaken from, but the only choice that we have is by choosing to use or not to use certain products or services. And we've seen in other areas, I'm thinking about organic farming in particular, where there's been a clear signal sent to the market that says, we want organic food, we don't want mass-produced food. I, I'm, with you, I'm, with, you, Benjamin, I'm with you, Benjamin, but aren't you there talking about incremental change while uh, the competing factors of what they're doing, say the NSA, CIA, and uh, all the software developers will outstrip uh, and whatever we're doing on an incremental basis? It may indeed be incremental. Um, certainly, if we are able to change one of these big laws, particularly in Australia, if you were able to knock back the metadata retention scheme or at least put warrants back in place, uh, that would be an incre incremental journey to get there, but the change itself would be momentous. Uh, what's happened this year, though, in Australia is quite the opposite, and that's what's particularly concerning in my mind, that there is so little awareness of the problem, and the political system is so out of line with, with the demands of, of the citizenry that we're able to get through warrantless collection of internet and telephone metadata, and nobody blinks an eye. Okay, Benjamin, thanks for hanging in there. It was good to hear from you, and thanks for getting up so early in New York. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. Car Thank you, Benjamin. Karun, what's your thoughts on what Benjamin actually said? They sort of fall in sync with, with what you're talking about, that there is hope and that there are protective factors. Well, when, whilst we have a situation where we have bipartisan support for the, the laws that we have, I mean, I think, uh, you know, the Labor has shown some interest in this area. We will now go to our next guest, John Lawrence Crossover. And John Lawrence is the uh, CEO of uh, Electronic Frontiers Australia. John, can you hear us? Uh, I can. Can you hear me? I can hear you. We've had, uh, we're have we hanging in there with technology tonight. All good. John, <laughs> you've heard some of the discussion tonight. What are your views on some of the, uh, what we've said? Uh, I confess that I haven't heard the discussion, but um, I'm happy to... Uh, happy to kick off if you've got some questions. Okay, in terms of digital rights, this is part of the internet governance and what you're actually about at Electronic uh, Frontiers Australia. Is there a possibility of Absolutely. digital rights in this country or, or is it a lie or is it a challenge too hard to overwhelm? Uh, okay, <laughs> well, that's a pretty broad question. Um, look, digital rights are a reality. Um, Australia is probably, well, not probably, Australia is less well protected in many of these contexts than uh, pretty much every other Western country around. Um, we're about the only country in the OECD, for example, that doesn't have um, any sort of pro constitutional protection for privacy or freedom of speech. Um, we do have an implied protection for political speech that the High Court has ruled on, but that's that's pretty much about as far as it goes. So. Digital rights, you know, as a as somebody trying to campaign for digital rights in this country, it is actually a much harder gig than it is in many other places um, because without those constitutional protections, that essentially means that we can't, you know, go and sue the government when they're doing the wrong thing because there's no reason to do so. And that's a really 
really difficult challenge for us. Well, and John, I you've actually nailed it. Uh, John, John, you've actually uh, John. highlighted something there, and you're talking about constitutional change effectively. How do we go, act if we have to rely on constitutional change, are we serious then about actually enabling digital rights in this country that would be effective? Well, I think, as we all know, constitutional change is one of the most difficult things to achieve in this country, and that's, you know, that's not... That's partly by design, and that's not necessarily a bad thing in its own right. Um, but really what that comes down to in, in, in practical reality, and we've seen this quite recently in, in legislation passed in this parliament, is the ability for legislators to kind of go well beyond where they might go elsewhere, and data retention is probably the, the, the best and most pertinent current example. Um, the laws that our Attorney General's department is currently struggling very hard to implement and not doing a terribly good job uh, on data retention. We're based on UK laws, which of course were based on the European Union Data Retention Directive, all of which has now been ruled unconstitutional. Okay. Um, Quickly, last, the, the, last question. I'd the like capacity to ask for you. that to happen in Australia just isn't there. That's the problem. I'd like to ask you uh, a question. Um, tell me something about the Five Eyes, the Alliance, when we've actually got that to deal with or whatever. We're talking about you know, a, a powerful, shadowy elite that's almost working extrajudicially. Even if we actually enable uh, digital rights laws, what's going to stop them from working in the ways that they've already done extrajudicially and without oversight and without effectively disregarding law? Well, <laughs> indeed. Uh, and look, it's very clear that they are working extrajudicially. Um, there is a very clear, there's quite a bit of evidence to um, support this idea of uh, what we might call sort of surveillance laundering, where um, each country has a degree of protection for its own citizens, but not for others. So, you know, maybe ASIO is not monitoring us, but we know the NSA is. Um, the New Zealand GCSB, I think it's called, uh, may not be necessarily, you know, doing mass surveillance of New Zealand citizens, although there is some evidence that suggests they are. Um, but, ASIS, but, you know, ASIS may well be and, and the Australian Signals Directorate. So we know that these things are happening. Our friends at Privacy International and Open Rights Group in the UK sued um, GCHQ in the UK, which is their sort of uh, Defence Signals Directorate, as it were, um, because they had used information that was gained illegally from the um, from the NSA in the US to go after organisations in the UK. They they sued them and they won that case. So we've proved that this is happening. Okay. On on that note, David. On that note, sorry, John. Uh, thank you <laughs> for the crossover. Thank you for coming on board. Uh, we're going to go to a commercial break and come back with Karun Cowper and David K. K. Our panelists.